All right. Uh, I'd like you, if you would, uh, please this morning to turn to Ezekiel chapter 7. I'm going to read the first 13 verses, although in the will of the Lord, we might uh, get further than that. But at least for, for reading purposes, we'll begin in verse 1 going down to verse 13. We're going to be thinking primarily, just in terms of a title, of the imminence of of divine judgment, the imminence of divine judgment. So it begins this way. It says in verse one, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, also thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel, an end, the end is come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end come upon thee and I will send mine anger upon thee and will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. And mine eye shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thine abominations shall be in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, an evil and only evil, behold, is come, an end is come, the end is come, it watcheth for thee, behold, it is come, the morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land, the time is come, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee, and accomplish mine anger upon thee, and I will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense thee for all thine abominations. And mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. I will recompense thee according to thy ways, and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee. And ye shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. Behold, the day, behold, it is come. The morning is gone forth, the rod hath blossomed, pride hath budded. Violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor of their multitude, nor of any of theirs. Neither shall there be wailing for them. The time is come, the day draweth near. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn. For wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. For the seller shall not return to that which is sold, although they were yet alive, For the vision is touching the whole multitude thereof, which shall not return, neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. And so again, God will, as always, bless the reading of his precious word. And so I want to just set chapter seven in its context. Remember, uh, we're in this section now, verse chapters six and seven where he is giving oral messages. And that said, it's not an unusual, uh, well, it normally wouldn't be an unusual thing, but in Ezekiel's case, it is. Because remember, he is God has made him mute, and the only time that he is going to speak is when he has a message from God. He was a man in whom there was no small talk. Now, when he speaks, he's got a message from God, and he, God opens his mouth to deliver it. And of course, the background is that he's, he's given these oral messages having acted out several of these dramatic kind of uh, things, lying on his side, having his hair cut, dividing the hair, all of these things that we've looked at so far, these these kind of very visual messages are now explained by oral messages. And so that's where we find ourselves. Chapter 6, the first of these oral messages, really spoke about the inevitability of judgment. Uh, that it couldn't be avoided. Judgment had to come because of the conduct of the tribe of Judah, the the, the nation of Judah. So, so it had to come. It was inevitable. Chapter 7 speaks of the imminence of divine judgment, that this judgment was right at the door. It was so close. Uh, it was, uh, the delay was was coming to an end. God's long suffering, if you like, had reached its limit and judgment was about to fall. So the whole prophecy of this chapter is occupied with the nearness and the completement, completeness of the judgment that had already been foretold. So that's kind of the background. God is going to judge. It is for, comes uh, in the form of a poetic lament. 
uh, I'm told, from, from Hebrew scholars. So it's kind of a poetic lament and uh, it differs from the previous chapters in that it, um, it, it, it kind of has that poetic bent to it, but it also closes up this first extended message of the book. So really the, the first section of the book is chapters one through seven, and this is kind of bringing the first section to an end. We'll move into a second section in chapter eight. We'll explain that when we get there, but it's on a different date. Uh, the first section is all to do with the first date in of the book. The second section opens a new series of messages that the prophet will bring. So it begins this way, of course, uh, if it's a message that's been delivered from God, of course, what a way to begin the message. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, and so the messenger is telling us, where did he get his message from? This is none other than the word of the Lord that came to Ezekiel the prophet. And of course, it's a message of impending doom. And I want, want to notice just a general thing that in verses two through four, and then in verses five through nine, you, you basically have this idea of a pen, impending doom, and it's repeated twice for emphasis. And just to kind of tie the two sections together, I want you to notice that how they, they end. In, in two through four, it ends in verse four with this, mine eyes Mine eye shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity. And then verse 5 through 9, how does that end? Look at verse 9. And mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. So that kind of links the two together, you see. So in other words, God is, is bringing this doom upon them and a doom in which there will be no pity shown to them. So it, really these are the messages that he's giving of, of threatening of imminent doom upon the nation. And what's sad is that uh, sometimes we hear messages from the Lord and they're, they're very clear, you know, kind of the way of the transgressor is hard, judgment is coming. And uh, the tragedy is that so often um, we, we hear those messages and then we forget them very quickly. And tragically, they would hear this message, but it wouldn't move them. Uh, they, they would they would just they'd hear it. it it's very clear god is spelling it out i mean he couldn't he couldn't make it any clearer than he does and yet and they hear the message but sadly they they do not do anything about it and of course they are going to realize when the blow falls that this was indeed a message from god because if you notice for instance verse four the whole purpose of this is the end of it he says, you shall know that I am the Lord. And so they would realize when this, this judgment fell that it is indeed God who is bringing the judgment and the visitation had indeed proceeded from him. And so he says in verse 2, also thou son of man saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel, an end, an end is come upon the four corners of the land. So it, this is where we get the idea of imminence, an end, an end is come and of course uh, the first time this phrase was was used in the old testament an end an end is come uh, is back in the book of amos and so if we want to just look at amos or forward i suppose in our bibles but um, uh, the book of amos and chapter eight uh, he was ministering to israel a herdsman from tekoa and this is what he says in chapter eight of Amos verses one and two, he says, "Thus saith, uh, thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit." Now, when we think of a basket of summer fruit, it looks very beautiful, doesn't it? You think of something that that, that looks lovely, right? This this lovely, and I don't know, just use your imagination, berries and uh, peaches and. Uh, uh, the ideal if it had mangoes in there that's one of my favorite fruit but all these all these lovely fruits and he, then he says in verse two and he said amos what seest thou and i said a basket of summer fruit then said the lord unto me the end is come upon my people of israel i will not again pass by them any more and so we say normally this would be a pleasant sight but actually it pictured israel ripe and ready for eating but in the sense of 
judgmental. God is bringing a judgment on them, ripe and ready for eating, just as they, this basket of fruit was ready for eating, just as they were ripe for judgment. And so the words, an end here, back in chapter 7, it's an exclamation. It's very strong language. He, so he says, an end, the end, is come. And so it's a, a message really kind of in a, its entirety is this. It's an end. The time of patience was over. There was n to be no more waiting. It, it's, it's really when the long suffering of God runs out. That's a kind of scary thing <laughs> when the long suffering of God runs out. What he's telling him is it's run out. <laughs> that this the judgment that they had been deserving of for a long time. But God in his long suffering had allowed a lot of time for repentance. And that's what he always does. He allows lots of time for repentance. They had not availed of that opportunity. And so now his long suffering had finally run out. And so the, the Ezekiel's accent on imminency and the urgency of his tone represents his reaction, in a sense, to public indifference and the refusal to take the divine threats seriously. The message had gone out. They'd been warned. Jeremiah talks about sending prophets rising up early, speaking to the nation, but they hadn't responded. And so as a result, the time had come and judgment was about to fall. They had defiled the land with their sins, and the only way the land could be cleansed was by punishing the people for their sins and clearing them off the land. And so you'll notice, he says, again in verse 2, Also, thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God, unto the land of Israel, an end the end is come upon the four corners of the land. So basically, God is literally going to empty the land of the sinners, take them out. Pretty much apart from that tiny remnant that we talked about, the land is going to be emptied because of the sin of the people. And of course, the dealings of God are to encompass, as we already said, the four corners of the land. And there's to be no more delay since the end is come upon thee. Now, when actually did this literally happens kind of interesting to to think about this god talks about imminence but actually um the judgment that he's speaking of it fell within four to five years of the commencement of the siege of jerusalem how do we know when this really took place let's look at second kings 25 this is this is when this judgment actually fell on the land and it describes it in detail. This is what is being prophesied about. And so we're going to read the first five verses of Second Kings 25. It says, It came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his host, against Jerusalem, and pitched against it, and they built forts against it round about, and the city was besieged unto the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine prevailed in the city, and there was no bread for the people of the land. And the city was broken up, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls, which is by the king's garden. Now the Chaldees were against the city round about, and the king went the way toward the plain, the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king, overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. So this is kind of the description of this imminent judgment. And we, we notice it says, begins in the ninth year of the reign of the king and ends in the 11th year, ninth to the 11th year when the siege is broken, the famine takes effect. Well, if we look back to Ezekiel 1 verse 1, came to pass in the 30th year in the fourth month among the fifth day of the month. Um, it says um, uh, it was the fifth year of King Joachim's captivity. Okay, so fifth year to 11th year, so it's four, five, six years, something like that before it all finally uh, occurs. So it said within four to five years, the commencement of the eighth, 18th month siege of Jerusalem by the Chaldeans that would result in this 
imminency being fulfilled. And so when we talk about imminency, we often talk about the Lord could come right now at any minute. <laughs> and of course, he could. We believe that. But in this case, uh, it's it, there's still, you know, for this prophecy to find its fulfillment, still four to five years before it actually finds its fulfillment. But that's still pretty close, isn't it? Imagine if uh, judgment on the American continent was going to come in four to five years. That's not a lot of time. <laughs> And it's all over, you know, kind of God is finally going to judge the nation. And that's not a prophecy. Don't think I'm being, a, I'm not a prophet and all the son of a prophet in case you're thinking I am. Uh, but I'm just saying, just imagine what that would be like uh, four to five years from now. Total devastation. That's what he's basically saying. Now, notice in verse three, it says, now is the end come upon thee and I, and I will send mine anger upon thee and will judge thee according to thy ways and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. I want you to notice the, the phrase here, thine abominations uh, shall be in the midst of thee. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. Oh, sorry, according to thy ways, all thine abominations. Verse 3, I'll send mine anger upon thee, will judge thee according to thy ways, recompense upon all the all thine abominations. I want you just to notice those two phrases. In other words, the judgment that God is bringing is very much merited. It's according to thy ways and also recompensing all thine abominations. And so basically, it's the consequence of Israel's or Judah's rebellious history. You know, in other words, what God is doing is absolutely just. They're getting what they deserved. This is God is righteous in his dealings, and, and they'll never be able to say to him uh, that this was not appropriate. It's a very appropriate verdict and sentence upon their behavior, uh, upon uh, their ways, and upon their abominations. And again, doesn't that bring out the beauty of the gospel? Because if any one of us on this call, if God dealt with us according to our ways and according to our abominations, we would be in serious trouble. <laughs> but the amazing thing about the gospel is that God dealt with his son, who ever lived to do the will of the Father to please him, and yet God, as it were, poured out his judgment on him who did no sin, who knew no sin, so that we uh, might be set free from the penalty of sin. So what a, what a wonderful gospel it is. But he is giving to them exactly what they deserve. And now notice in verse 4, it says, Mine eye shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways, there we got it again, thy ways upon thee, and thine abomination shall be in the midst of thee. You shall know that I am the Lord. Now, I want to just focus on this little expression, thine abomination shall be in the midst of thee. It's a very interesting phrase. And the thought is that when the Babylonians come and can conquer uh, the land, uh, strewn across the land will be the evidences of their abominations. In other words, the various idols that they worship, the various shrines, they'll be they'll be in tatters, but they'll be there for everybody to see. And so the thought is that um, uh, the, the, the various, various implements of idolatry will lie in the land when it's laid waste, and it will be a continual reminder of the reason for and the merit of the judgment that they received. It's really telling them, this is why this has happened. That's that, So the evidence will be there for all to see. And so uh, certainly uh, that will be the case. Now, it's interesting too, at the end of verse 4, not only does it tell us that the evidence of their sin will be there to be seen, after the land is desolate, you'll still see these kind of fallen idols and all the rest of it. But then he says, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Again, we've talked about this before, that purpose of his message is that they might know that he is the Lord. And one of the things that, that this judgment did, and we've mentioned this several times before, but it actually had its effect. And it, it, it they first of all, seeing the idols are all around that they'd worship showed that they couldn't help them. The destruction that came on the land, their idols were useless. And so when they're taken into Babylon, they're, they're, they're finally cured of idolatry. Even though it had plagued the nation 
from its really from its very earliest days they'd always had this go into the book of judges they're building idols you know early on and yet f- after all these years finally the babylonian captivity cures them when they come back after 70 years there's no idolatry in fact there's a little reviving amongst the people when they return back and and sadly it was short lived uh, heart affection to the lord uh, and then they went into just ritualism and going through the motions, but they never had an issue with idols again. And so they really did come to that realization that he is the Lord and, and that all these other idols are useless. And so the Lord used it in that respect. And then verse five, he says, thus saith the Lord God, an evil and only evil behold is come. An only evil, literally, an evil which is one. Uh, and the idea is it's an evil so all-embracing as to be complete in itself. It doesn't need any repetition. This judgment would be very, very significant, very severe. And, of course, the word evil itself has has with it certain ideas. And, you know, sometimes people ask the question, well, um, you know, can God do evil? And, of course, that's a big question, isn't it? People ask, is it possible? And and so we got to understand, what, is, what do we mean by evil? And so the word evil here has the sense of calamity. God is bringing this calamity. And, of course, it's merited. It's a result of they are reaping what they have sown. God is allowing this judgment as a way to recompense them for their rebellion, their wickedness. But the idea that anything evil could initiate from the heart of God is absolutely false. (laughs) Uh, God is good in every way. Uh, But he also, as a loving father, knows how to chasten his children. And so this this whole idea of calamity is probably a a good way of rendering this. When we look at the, the various things in the Old Testament, calamity is a better way of describing it. And so it gives it really an appropriate rendering, really. And so verse six, he says again, an end is come. The end is come. It watcheth for thee. Behold, it is come. So this retribution um, is come upon them uh, because of their wicked ways. And it's interesting how it says um, th- that it's, it, it's again, the em- imminence is r- emphasized. You notice three times here, an end is come, an end is come. It watches for thee, behold, it is come. So again, strong emphasis. In fact, if you're an underliner, um, eight times in this little section, is come is come is come so that's kind of that's what i've underlined in my bible just to because it, it, it helps me when i read it, it kind of stands out this is talking about imminence so but the, the little phrase it watches for thee is very interesting and the root of that word it watches for thee is is the word to awake um when you're awake you're watching that's the idea and so it's uh it's it, it literally uh, strong uh, in his concordance, indicates the thought of abruptness in start starting up from sleep, and so the thought is this: that God's retribution on the nation, it, it it seemed to them that he was asleep, but all of a sudden, he's awoken in judgment upon them. That's the picture. And so uh, it, the abruptly commencing its work without delay, uh, God, uh, if he appeared to be slumbering, has finally woken up and is dealing with the situation there uh, in the land by bringing this judgment and bringing it with imminence. Verse 7, the morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land, the time is come, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. Again, some very kind of difficult things here, Uh, this phrase, the morning. Some translations have, instead of the morning is come, they'll say the doom is come. And so you ask yourself, well, how, how how did translators, because it's not even a textual issue, it's just how they translate it. Some translate it morning, some translate it doom. And so the question is, well, why is it so difficult to translate if if it come up with seemingly two very different things, doom and mourning. Well, the Hebrew word, I'm told, means to plait or to braid. 
And so the idea of braiding a garland of flowers, you know, so somebody has a braid of flowers in their hair, that kind of idea. And and so how how did they come up with morning or doom? Well, probably from the image that w- that which comes around. If you're braiding something, you know, it comes back around, you know, around the head, that kind of idea. And so, or a circuit, we might say. And so um, for a braided garland, it's the result of weaving flowers into a circle. And so mourning is that which comes around day by day. And the doom of the Israelites has finally come around. So that's how they went. One went, group went mourning, another group went doom. It's that which has finally come around, just like the morning. We went to bed last night, and guess what? Morning came around, and here we are. <laughs> and this doom surely is coming around. Uh, it's going to complete its circuit. The circuit of their sins is about to be finished. The day would be a day of terror and tumult. It says, the morning is come unto thee, and thou that dwellest in the land, the time is come, the day of trouble is near. And then he says, not the sounding again of the mountains. Again, kind of difficult phrase. Uh, this chapter gives interpreters uh, some work to do. I, I want to say this. And so um, what does that mean, not the sounding of the mountains again? Well, given the opening of the address in chapter 6, where he says in verse 2, Son of man, set thy face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them. And remember, the reason it was addressed to the mountains of Israel was because of all the high places where they called out to their idols on the top of the mountains, right? Just like uh, if you remember the story of Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal and they're, they're shouting out to their idols, okay? That's what was going on in the land of Israel. But after this judgment, it says the day of trouble is he is near and not the sounding again of the mountains. And the idea is this, that it will put an end to these mountain shrines where they're crying out to their false deities. There'll be a silence on the mountains after God's judgment has come. He's going to silence these high places forever. And so he says in verse 8, Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee and accomplish mine anger upon thee, and I will judge thee. Again, notice this judgment is just according to thy ways and will recompense thee from for all thine abominations. Again, we just want to say this is the law of sowing and reaping. What a man sows, that shall he also reap. Uh, they they had sowed wickedness. They are going to reap calamity. And so that's kind of the thought here that God is bringing before them. They're getting upon them that which they merit fully. They deserve this. This is exactly what's fitting for their s- persistent sin. And notice verse 9, he says, Mine eye shall not spare neither will I have pity. Again, repeated, we said from verse 4, This we said this is poetic. So you've got kind of two stanzas, uh, 2 through 4, 5 through 9, repeating the same idea that judgment is imminent. God is not going to show them pity. He's not uh, going to spare them. But he, I will recompense thee again, according to thy ways and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee, and you shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. And so they would they would come to the realization that this was the Lord who had smitten them. Even though he's going to use the Babylonians as his instrument, they will recognize this is not just some kind of global event, you know, the rise of the Babylonian Empire. They are going to know that actually behind this Babylonian invasion is none other than the Lord who they have neglected and rejected and committed adultery against and done all of these abominations, they will recognize this is divine judgment. And so, uh, and and he is the one uh, that indeed has been responsible uh, for smiting them. Of course, it's troubled a lot of people, uh, this idea of the Lord that smiteth them. And again, and yet, should it should it do that? Uh, when we look at Revelation 19, when the Lord Jesus comes back, 
and he's going to have this sharp sword coming out of his mouth, and he's going to smite the nations with a rod of iron, Psalm 2 says, right? So so again, he, he reject his mercy, reap his judgment. That's basically the message. Uh, if you reject the divine mercy, what can you expect but divine judgment? And so the Lord is the one that is wielding and smiting them, using the Babylonians as his instrument. Now, as we move in, uh, and again, maybe should I, I should have done this in giving you kind of a bit of an outline. And so let me just do that now. So in verses 1 through 9, we have the imminence of judgment that's being emphasized. And now, uh, verse 10 and 11, we have the iniquity at its height. We're going to see why this judgment fell, the iniquity at its height, the, uh, how it reached its peak and God had to judge. Verse 12 through 16, we're going to see the inclusiveness of the judgment, uh, how it's going to affect all. Verse 17 through 19, uh, we're going to learn about the impotence of wealth, that uh, oftentimes people try and uh, provide wealth because they are thinking, well, if disaster comes, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I've got my, I can use my gold, and we're going to find out that that was powerless to help them. In fact, the the, the picture in that section is they're going to be leaving their wealth on the streets when they flee. It's not going to do them any good at all. The impotence of wealth, verse twenty through twenty two, and we're going to look at the impurity of the temple. One of the biggest reasons for the judgment was they had defiled the temple of God, the, the impurity of the temple. And then verse 23 through 27, the ineffectiveness of leadership. Really kind of the heart of all this was the leaders of the nation had really failed to give an example to the people. Uh, in fact, they had given an example to the people, but it was an example of wickedness. And it wasn't, they weren't giving proper lead. And so that's kind of the, the outline of the section. But in this outline, we're going to see um, that there are five word pictures that he is going to use uh, in this uh, this section from verse 10 onwards. So I'm going to just mention them. And so the first one we're going to look at is the budding rod. And so we'll see in verse 10, Behold the day, behold it come, the morning is gone forth, the rod hath blossomed, pride hath budded. So that's the first picture. Then we'll look at a second picture, which is a picture of the business world. And so you'll notice that in verse 3, the seller shall not return to that which is sold, though they were yet alive. It talks about the seller and the buyer, verse 12. So it's, it's going to look at the, the budding rod first, verse 10 and 11, the business world. Uh, we're going to see verse 12 and 13 particularly. And, and then verse uh, third one is going to be the watchman on the wall, verse 14. They have blown the trumpet even to make all ready. And so we've already seen that in chapter three, but we're going to see it, the watchman mentioned again. Uh, again, we're going to notice another one, the morning doves on the hillside, another word picture in verse um, 16, uh, they that escape of them shall escape and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning. So morning doves, we're going to look at that picture. And then the fifth one is throwing away their valuables. We've already mentioned that, but it says... Um, and they also shall gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall cover them. Uh, shame shall be upon their faces, verse 19. They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and gold shall not be able to deliver them. And so uh, that uh, is the final picture, throwing away. Can you imagine the scene? They're fleeing from the approaching Babylonian army, and what can I carry with me? All of this stuff that they've been amassing, is going to do them no good at all. It's just going to be thrown in the streets. So kind of graphic pictures that we're going to see in this section. So the first one uh, of these five word pictures is the, the budding rod. And we mentioned it already, but verse 10, Behold the day, behold it is come, the morning is gone forth, the rod hath blossomed, pride hath budded, violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness, none of them shall remain, nor of their multitude, nor any of theirs, neither shall there be wailing for them. So, the picture of the budding rod. Of course, we are familiar with the pictures of a budding rod before, from the book of Numbers. We'll uh, indeed come back to that uh, shortly. Uh, but uh, just to give you, again, interpretive issues here, the rabbis 
have traditionally interpreted the rod as Babylon. And they base that on Isaiah chapter 10. In other words, this budding rod is really speaking of the Babylonians who God is going to use in judgment. And so back in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5, it says, and again, it's not speaking of Babylon here, but it's speaking of Assyria who God had already used to judge the northern kingdom, the ten tribes uh, of uh, Israel. And so he says uh, in verse 5, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger in the staff in their hand is mine indignation. And so, in other words, God took uh, Assyria and used them as his chastening rod for Israel. And so the rabbis would say, well, here we go again. But this time, God's rod is no longer the Assyrians, but it's the Babylonians. So that would be the general view of the um Rabbis. Now, just to again to give credence to their position, um, they would also quote Jeremiah 51, where it talks about the Medo Persians being God's instrument. This time it's not a rod, but it's an axe in the, the hand of the Medo Persians to punish Babylon for their cruelty in the way they punished Judah. And so if you look at Jeremiah 51 and verse 20. Jeremiah verse 20, uh, 51, verse 20, he says, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms, and with thee will I break in pieces the horse and his rider, with thee will I break in pieces the chariot and his rider, with thee also will I break in pieces man and woman, with thee will I break in pieces old and young, with thee will I break in pieces the young man and the maid, I will also break in pieces with thee the shepherd and his flock. With thee will I break in pieces the husbandman and his yoke of oxen. With thee will I break in pieces captains and rulers. And I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight, saith the Lord. And so uh, that, in, in this case, was the Medo-Persians who God would use uh, Notice verse 28, just to confirm this, prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes, the captains thereof, and all the rulers thereof, and all the land of his dominion. So just as God was going to use the Assyrians as his rod to, to deal with Israel, here we have he's going to use the Medo-Persian Empire as his axe to deal with Babylon for their cruelty. And so their logical assumption, according to the rabbis, is then, this budding rod must speak of Babylon, who God was going to use to judge Israel. All sounds good. However, we said that the first time we see the budding rod is in the book of Numbers. And if you want to go back there, the book of Numbers chapter 17. Numbers chapter 17. This is where there was rebellion in the camp against Moses and Aaron, and we notice in verse 8, it says, It came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. So in this case, this budding rod represented a tribe of Israel, the tribe of Levi who God is affirming were to be the ones that served in the sanctuary because everybody else said, you know, aren't we all the same? Can't we do this? And the answer was no, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, reserved for the house of Levi. So based on number 17, eight, the thought is that here's another tribe that's budded. And so notice again, Behold the day, behold it's come, the morning is gone forth, the rod hath blossomed, pride hath budded. And could this be speaking of Judah? Pride hath budded. Violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor of their multitude, nor of any of theirs, neither shall they be wailing for them. 
And the thought basically is this, that the, the, the tribe of Judah, the, the southern kingdom, they had blossomed instead of into a, a nation that brought praise to Jehovah, that what had blossomed was pride and violence. And therefore, judgment was fitting upon them. In other words, iniquity had reached its height. Uh, it, it, they brought forth, instead of bringing forth praise to Jehovah, instead of bringing forth that which was fitting, they had brought forth wickedness. And so the budding and blossoming is explained here. Clearly, the rod represents, and I believe this is the right interpretation, the tribe of Judah, they had blossomed into a wicked people and were only fit for judgment. What a tragedy, in a sense, that the people that should have been appraised to Jehovah had blossomed into wickedness, pride, and violence. And uh, it's always a, a sad thing, isn't it, when when people that should be bringing forth beautiful fruit <laughs> were bringing forth that which was a stench uh, to the Lord. And so that's contextually, it seems to fit better, the iniquity at its height. Verse 12, we, we notice again, he says, the time is come, the day draweth near. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. So now we get a picture of the business world. And uh, it's a it's a, a interesting picture of commercial transactions. Um, and saying that they'll really be of no consequence. When judgment is imminent on the nation, all of this stuff that goes on that we think is so important suddenly becomes meaningless. And so he talks about the normal way of things is the buyer rejoices because he thinks he's got a bargain. On the other hand, the seller mourns because he thinks that he's, you know, he's given away a bad deal. It's all a sham, right? Isn't it? They, they you know, they, they feel like they're being hard done by selling it. But, uh, and the, the, the guy going away thinks he's got a bargain, but, but oftentimes they're just playing a game. And so, again, the thought here is the smile of the buyer who thinks he has made a good bargain, the long face of the seller who pretends he has been worsted will be a thing of the past. This is not going to happen. The commercialism is going to come to an end when this judgment occurs. Now, perhaps the background, verse 13 says, for the seller shall not return to that which is sold, although they were yet alive, for the vision is touching the whole multitude thereof, which shall not return, neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. So perhaps the real background here, again, we're thinking of the land of Israel, how they do business. The real background is the year of Jubilee. Okay, so I want to talk about what, what do we mean by the year of Jubilee? And to understand that, we've got to go back to the Old Testament again. Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 25. And we'll read from verse 8. It says, Thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seventh Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. So this is now year 50. Okay. You shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you and ye shall return every man to his possession. You shall return every man to his family. A jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. You will not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. For it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of the jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. So very interesting biblical concept is this year of jubilee. And so uh, the thought was this, that, that year, the land lay fallow. They were to let the land lay fallow uh, every seventh year, and then 
again in the 50th year. And of course, elsewhere, God says, I'm going to provide you double crops on the sixth year, so you'll be able to do this. I, you know, I, God's very practical. You, you're not going to lose out by doing this, but the land needs its rest. And other things like if you were an Israelite who had fallen into hard times and you had to sell yourself to be a slave, at the year of Jubilee, all slaves were to be released. Jewish slaves were to be released. Captives were set free. Not only that, um, you know, they were given their tribal inheritance. But what if through hard times you had to sell your inheritance? Well, you sold your inheritance, but in the 50th year, you got it back. It returned to its original owners. And so actually the value of a piece of land was determined by the number of years left till the year of Jubilee. If you had 50 years to go, then you get a lot of money for it. If you only had one year to go, you'd get very little because, you know, the owner's got to get it back in the 50th year. And so what he's telling them is this, and it's very important. He'd already Jeremiah had already told the captives they would be in Babylon for 70 years. Just look at Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 10. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. And so the thought is this. Concerning business world in the, the land of Judah, you might think, oh, I've sold this piece of land. I'm on hard times, but I'm getting it back. But what the Lord is saying is you're not going back there. In 50 years, <laughs> you're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. And so uh, that is is kind of the, the thought behind it. There's no going back. The seller who convinced himself that he would one day return to his property was living in a fool's paradise. Ironically, part of the reason for the 70 years of captivity was that God was collecting on the Sabbath years when they had failed to let the land rest. Just look at Second Chronicles, just uh, chapter 36. Second Chronicles 36, and we'll notice um, the reason for the their captivity and their judgment. It says, moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen, polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. We know all that. We're going to see it in chapter 8 of Ezekiel very clearly. The Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, uh, because he had compassion on his people and in his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy, until an end, an end was come, as we're seeing in our chapter of Ezekiel. Therefore, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary. He had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand, all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, the measure, the treasures of the king and of his princes. All these he brought to Babylon. And it says, and they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem, burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord. Now listen to this by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three scores and 10 years. So isn't that interesting? That So every seventh year, they were to let the land rest. God was going to give them double on the sixth year so they could, they could get through the seventh and be ready and have corn to plant in the eighth. All the rest of it, God had it all worked out. But their greed took over. They failed to keep the Sabbath year and they pocketed the extra, and God kept perfect records. And he said, my land will get its rest. You owe me 70 years. And so that 70 years, 
God allowed the land to stay fallow and to get its rest. He collected on his Sabbaths. And so in context here, in our little passage, um, he's telling us that the business world is going to be deeply affected by this judgment. They're not going to be doing commercial transactions. And even if they do it right up to the end, thinking, oh, I'll be able to come back to my land that I've sold uh, in, at the year of Jubilee, that was not going to happen. And so this little word picture is one that stands out to us. Now, the next one, verse 14, he says, they have blown the trumpet. So this is the uh, the watchman on the walls, even to make all ready, but none goeth to the battle for my wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. The sword is without, the pestilence, the famine within. He that is in the field shall die with the sword. He that is in the city, famine and pestilence shall devour him. So again, we're, we're familiar. Ezekiel chapter 3, God made Ezekiel to be a watchman on the walls. But he's saying at this point, because judgment is come, right? Imminency of judgment. At this point, it's an exercise in futility. There's no army to rally to the trumpet warning. The sword, famine, and pestilence were ready to devour them, and they were not uh, going to respond. They hadn't responded up to now. They're not going to respond at this point. And so, of course, verse 15 is quite self-explanatory. Nowhere would be safe, either without the city or within the city. Disobedience meant loss of life for them. Um, and, of course, for you and I, Disobedience doesn't necessarily mean we lose our life, but it does mean we lose something of our spiritual vitality, don't we? Uh, it's not a good thing to be walking in disobedience. That that in a divine vitality and energy is lost. Uh, by the way, sometimes if we persist, uh, then we already know from 1 Corinthians 11, uh, some are weak and sickly, some are asleep. Sometimes the Lord does take us home prematurely, but we would just say, generally speaking, that the idea is this, that disobedience always causes with it a loss of spiritual vitality. May the Lord help us as we face this week ahead to live with deep spiritual vitality and not allow disobedience sappers of usefulness for the Lord. And realize that just as he warns of imminence, judgment is coming, we also believe in imminence the imminency of the Lord's return to snatch us away to meet Christ in the air. And it could be at any moment. <laughs> and so are we living in the light of imminency? Are we conducting our business in the light of imminency? Um, are we walking with the idea that perhaps today could be the day when the Lord comes? May the Lord encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.